I'm the Deputy Director with the Georgia Council on Development and Disabilities, and you have joined the weekly COVID-19 Zoom meeting put on by the Georgia Developmental Disabilities Network uh, and many partnering organizations, which you will see in a logo on your screen at, at some point here. And we're so grateful for a, a powerful uh, consortium of, of partners. Our aim for this weekly meeting uh, is to address issues and concerns related to COVID-19. This week, uh, we will focus on education in the era of COVID-19. And we do recognize that in the noise of social media, email, and news outlets, it can be very overwhelming to sort through what's pertinent. And we hope that you will find these weekly gatherings a place where you can get some clarity. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to update you all on is the state of affairs uh, in Georgia. And we got some great guidance from the governor's office on vulnerable populations. And I thought that would be a great place to just start and provide a, a quick overview of that guidance and uh, make sure we all understand what an underlying medical condition is and that we're clear on our rights to make our own decisions. So you'll see there on the screen, thanks to Susanna, that although the state has begun to reopen, uh, we are still under a must order to shelter in place through the June 12th, uh, if you fall under any of these categories. So that's uh, people 65 years of age, older, living in a nursing home or long care long-term care facility, having a chronic lung disease, moderate to severe asthma, heart disease, if you're immunocompromised, uh, have class three or severe obesity, and if you're a person with diabetes, liver disease, chronic kidney disease, and under, undergoing dialysis. Now what's pertinent here is that the governor didn't say shall, but did say must. So. Uh, that means if you fall into one of those categories or have an underlying condition. And the key here is that underlying condition is where you have some discretion to make your own decision as a family about what's safe for you and whether or not you consider the nature of your disability to be an underlying condition. Um, so from there, we will move on and do a quick poll on the screen so that we can get a sense of who's joined us this time. Uh, and while you respond to that poll, I'm gonna just let you know what the categories here are. So we're asking how you identify yourself. You can choose multiples. The options are individual with a disability, a family member of an individual with a disability, a service provider, a DD, uh, excuse me, a DVHDD employee, a G, uh, which is the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, a Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency employee, DCH or Department of Community Health, Department of Public Health or DPH, Georgia DOE or Georgia Department of Ed, policymakers and staff, and other. And we do recognize we couldn't capture all possible categories. There are some limitations to poll Zoom. So about 82 of the 122 people on the line have responded. And while you all work on that, I'm going to turn it over to Susanna to review the housekeeping. All right. Well, just real quickly, we do have closed captioning and ASL interpretation um, ready to go for this. If you need closed captioning, there is a box on the bottom of your screen that says CC closed caption. You can click on that and figure out which, if you would like running um, captioning along the bottom, or if you would like a transcript, which will show up in a chat box to your right. Um, and if you need ASL interpreting, we have two ASL interpreters who will be taking turns. We have um, them named ASL, ASL Paula and ASL Rivka on your screen. Um, if you need interpreters, 
um, for this call, you can hover over one of the two of their um, videos where they are, and there's three white dots in a blue box, um, and you can click on that, and then you can hit pin video, and it will make their video the um, primary video on your screen. I think that is all for that piece. Thank you. I think it is. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, Susanna, I don't know if you've had time to show the logo slide, but if you haven't, this might be a good time while I just go through some ground rules real quickly. Um, so, folks, you'll notice that everyone is starting off muted. You can raise your hand inside Zoom, or you can put your question in the chat. And and uh, if time allows, we will read it and answer it right here, or we will submit those questions uh, for answering at a later time. We've tracked everything in a frequently asked questions document, which we'll share with you later today. If you are speaking, please know we have packed this agenda with what we hope will be really useful information. So try to keep your questions and responses to about 30 seconds each. Of course, one person should speak at a time. Um, we do have a dedicated email address, which is gaddcovid19 at gmail.com. So that's Georgia or gaddcovid19 at gmail.com. You can email us with resources. You can email questions. Uh, and we regularly monitor that box and we'll be in communication with you. So we want this to be an open forum for folks to share about their experience and get good and relevant information. If you are sharing about someone else, please be mindful that you may be sharing personal health information and that because we are recording this uh, and we also record the chat where people are sharing resources and asking really important questions. Uh, just be mindful of sharing about someone else uh, in a way that they would be comfortable with. All right, thanks so much. We're gonna turn it over to Mark Crenshaw to go over some resources and updates. Mark? Good afternoon, you all. Uh, looks like there are 145 of us on the call this afternoon, which is amazing. Um, I'm so grateful uh, that we have this opportunity to come together in this time. So um, just wanted to, I'm pasting a link in the chat box right now, which is a link to the resource folder that we have, um, that we keep adding to on Google Drive. Um, Susanna has a, a, a screenshot of it. Uh, actually, it's not a screenshot. She has it up on the screen now um, to show you um, the diversity of resources that have been collected. Um, I want to say a word of thank thanks to Hillary Hibben, who has done a great job over the last couple of weeks organizing that folder, hopefully in a way that makes sense to um, to um, folks who, who go and get a look at the resources in there. Um, I promise you, if a resource has been listed on the, on one of these calls over the last five weeks, it is in there. Um, but I will say that um, those aren't the only resources in there. So um, if you are looking for something related to um, um, <clears throat> caring for, living with, advocating with um, a person, a person with a disability in this time, um, that would be the first place I would suggest that you uh, go and look. Um, also, in our weekly recap of the call, this link goes out in the email. So if for some reason you miss it today, you will have a chance to uh, access it um, via the email that will go out. So. Um, uh, and the other thing I would say is if, if you have found a resource that you think is helpful for you and might be helpful for others, um, I would encourage you to share it with our email address 
uh, the GADD COVID19 at gmail.com email address so that we can share it for the good of other folks. So um, now we've got um, moving on to the next part of our agenda. We have um, three folks who we have invited to sort of frame um, stories for us related to their experience of. Um, getting educational supports and services during this time of COVID-19. So the first voice we're going to hear from, um, I think, um, is Candace Knobloch from Gwinnett County. I see Candace. Thank you for being on with us today, and thanks for your willingness to share. So I'm just going to turn it over to you for a few minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Um... Uh, we have a son, Daniel, that is 19 years old. He'll be 20 in uh, June, and he has been in the Gwinnett County Educational School System and graduated from high school last year. Um, he's moderate uh, disability, and so he went into the BICE Center up here and is in the ADAPT program. So this was our first year um, in that program. Um, Added on top of that, um, on our learning curve, um, he had a new teacher, has a new teacher that moved up um, from the disability teaching from an elementary school. So I know it, um, when we hit, hit the um, doing the E-class, it was extremely difficult for her because um, being in elementary school, I believe she served a severe class. So she was not in the know about anything um, that you would do with an E-class. Um, so, you know, the first two, two and a half weeks were um, completely difficult. Um, our son, you know, he doesn't understand anything to do with the, with the COVID, so thank goodness he doesn't have anxieties about that part of it. Um, but as far as getting him up, getting him on a routine, um, you know, honestly, that wasn't real hard. My husband's working at home. I do not work. Um, well, I work as a substitute teacher and I work at a um, farm that um, is part time also, but it all involves the school system. So I was out of work also. Um, so I was able to devote full attention to him. But I would say the biggest challenges was the technology and is continues to be the technology. Um, the technology, um, it just wasn't there to begin with, with the teacher not knowing how to navigate it, um, from her support not knowing how to navigate it, from there being um, crashes in the system to trying to figure out, do we do Zoom, do we do Google? Um, the uh, whole part of what she thinks that we see as a student or as a parent, she didn't see that part. So then we'd have to try to explain that to her. She'd have to go back to her people that were tech support for her to figure it out. And they're totally overloaded with their hands full. So that's that's one of the things that caused um, added stress on me and then added stress on our son. So I finally get him to sit down at the computer. Okay, you know, this is going to go good. You're going to be able to see. So we load everything. We open it up and nothing, you know. So then that shuts him down, um, you know. And, and, and I'm real aware and, you know, I understand, you know, I understand it all. It's just um, very, very difficult. Um, I think you know, one of the things across the board with special needs is their um, shutting down, you know, behaviors, um, and then having to pull him out of that to sit back down to a place that he's already decided, this isn't working, why am I going to go there again, um, to, you know, one of his main IEP goals is socialization. So, you know, that need does not get met um, electronically. Um, so, you know, the, the teachers have hung in there, um, you know, now we're on what, week four or five. Um, they've definitely, um, it's gone smoother. There's more, um, now 
they've everybody has one another's phone numbers <laughs> their own personal cell phone numbers and that's great because you know and and they've been a lot more easy it's like well you know i'd text them and say well you know he's not out of the bed yet and they go that's fine you know, just have him give us a call when you get a chance and that's awesome um because that really does need to be the way that it is um, just very flexible. So they're, they're all with that. The pair of pros are with that too. Um, so that's kind of our experience. Candace, thanks so much um, for helping folks on this call understand um, what your family is, has experienced. If there were, if they were a, sort of a call to action, um, anything, um, from the, that folks on this call could do to support your family or families like yours. You know, I, I hear sort of the need for understanding and flexibility. Is there, um, is there anything else that you would ask um, um, folks on this call to p pay particular attention to in this time? Well, I think, um, I think one of the things that, um, the special needs um, community uh, struggles with, you know, particularly moms is isolation. And so this is, um, so even without this, it, 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 I already feel kind of isolated. Um, I don't particularly um, connect with doing what we're doing now. I mean, it, it meets maybe five to 10% of a need. Um, some of the things I know, some of the day programs, because one thing I'm telling you, this has really opened my eyes, even though I feel like I've been aware of what's going to happen 22 years old and Daniel's not in the system anymore. Um, it's all going to be on me. Um, so it, it's helped me to understand the significance of that, that I'm doing something now more. Um, some of the day programs that I have started keeping my eye on and I am somewhat um, connected to, you know, they've done things like drive-by lunches, you know, and if, if our school system, you know, is going to provide lunches to people that need it, you know, why not at the buy center, for example, whoever can do it, you know, get their kids in the car, you know, have some of the staff members up there and they drive by, that would mean the world to, um, you know, to, to students that have disabilities, I believe, you know, they're looking for a face. They're looking for a familiar face during this scary time. Um, and they're sick of seeing my face. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for having me. So the next person um, we've invited on um, and uh, to talk about her experience um, is Martha Haythorn. Martha's a student in uh, Decatur in DeKalb County. So Martha, do you mind just sharing with the group um, from your perspective what this has been like? Yes, um, I am here. Um, this is Martha Haythorn um, and I am 20 years old and I'm a senior at Decatur High School. Um, I am graduating in May. However, because of COVID-19, I would not be able to walk across the stage and my actual graduation and actually get my diploma on stage. And I'm actually kind of devastated about that, actually, because I was really looking forward to actually walking across that stage at my school, knowing I have achieved something. Now, I know that I did, but if I were walking across that stage with other people in my class and getting the same experience that other friends get to do, it would be absolutely amazing. And now I'm not getting that chance in Decatur High School. I go to Decatur High School here in Decatur, Georgia, and I just find it really frustrating that I'm not getting the chance to be able to walk across that stage. And even though I wish I could, I would do anything right now to do that. So Martha, is there is there anything that um, you would say to folks on this call about your experience to this point? Um, is, there, are there, is there anything at all that folks on this call could do to support you or, and people like you who are graduating um, and not getting to experience their, gradu their graduation ceremonies? So yes, it is said that um, 
that I would like to let people know about. It's called Some Good News. It's a graduation episode that just came out that celebrates these college graduates, high school graduates, people who graduate in the world that are going through this right now. And they are still, even though they can't walk the stage, they, um, this man named John on Some Good News did this graduation episode for all these students to support them through this and celebrate the graduation still. And I guess I would say for people like me right now in particular is even though we're all going through this, continue to celebrate students who are graduating. so them that they can still have their pride. They work for this. They accomplish something. They've achieved something. And they will continue their greatness. So even though there's this disease right now, we are all going through this together. We can still celebrate our successes. And even though it may sound like, you, you know, you did all this work. It is never over. You've worked so hard to achieve your dreams. So continue to achieve your dreams. Your child or your, or your senior or your graduate can have these experiences and will still go to college and will have an amazing experience that will change your life forever. Nice. Thank you, Martha. I really appreciate your time to share your story today. Um, and and um, I, I lost count of how many people wished you congratulations in the chat box. So if you, if you had access to it, you should, um, you should go and, and see all the people who are wishing you con congratulations. Um, and like we I said, can, thank you. Th we thank can you copy for, them all and send them to Martha later. That's great. That's, that's great. A good idea. That's a fabulous idea, Susanna. Thank you. And and thank you for your um for your uh call to action for folks to continue to celebrate people like you at this time. Definitely. So the third um story um that we wanted to hear today in terms of framing this conversation is from Sheila Jeffrey, who's a member of Uniting for Change, which is a self-advocacy organization here in Georgia and Uniting for Change is, uh, as many of you probably heard last week, is one of the organizations sponsoring this call. So Sheila, if you're on, we'd love to hear from you at this point. Okay, can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I'm I got a new computer, so I'm trying to work from the computer today. Um, basically, my story is, is I have a seven-year-old daughter who Supposed to be going to third grade, I'm hoping she did, because I don't have communications with her teachers, so I don't even know what her grade scores or anything that ha happening with the school system. It's like they give her assignments and they're not constant with her assignments. They're not cons consistent schedule with her assignments. So it's always week to week and my daughter has ADHD and hyperactive disorder. So with her, it's kind of like best for me as a schedule. But when you go in to check her work for that next week, it's a whole different schedule. And then there's times she don't even want to do the work. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not a teacher. I'm just a parent trying. And when she don't want to work, do the work, I'm, I'm fortunately, I'm not going to make her because she gets mad and agitated. So I just try to go day by day of um, doing what I can with her and trying to do the virtual learning, trying to get stuff in for her. But like I said, we're all in this together, but when you're not a parent and you're not getting, I mean, you're not a teacher and you're not getting help from your teachers, it's like you're left out there to do it on your own. And that's my hard thing right now is the schedule and communications through the DeKalb County school system. Thanks for sharing your story, uh, Sheila. Um, I wonder, just like I asked uh, Martha and Candace, is there anything um, in terms of a call to action that you would offer for people on this call? Um, I, would, I would say, no matter if you are a person or are not a person with this disability, if you're fighting with the DeKalb County School or, or Gwinnett, whatever school system you're fighting with, 
don't don't back down. Keep fighting with them. Because at the end, we're all here together to fight together. And if you're having a struggle situation with your child in the school system, fight until you can't fight no more. Thank you, Sheila. And thanks for coming on today to, to share your story to help frame this conversation. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thanks, all. That was such an important segment hearing from folks experiencing the impact of COVID-19 on their educational experience. We are going to move now into our educational rights section where we've had uh, graciously uh, gotten folks from the state, from the federal, and from the advocacy and legal perspectives willing to share information with us. And I do just want to kind of frame it up and say that um, every week we've had well over 100 folks join and thankfully many experts willing to join us and share uh, the information they have available in what is a very ever-changing situation. And so we've, we've agreed to give every person the benefit of the doubt and to know that we're all communicating the best answers that we can uh, with the best of intents at the time and that we commit to uh, going back and finding answers to things that we, we don't have the answers to right now. Um, and we're just so appreciative of folks willing to join a big group and share what they know and all the resources that you see presented here today will be available in the drive. You're welcome to put questions in the chat and we will articulate those uh, if time allows during the Q&A and if not, we'll revisit them. So our first speaker is Annie Acosta who is the Director of Fiscal and Family Support Policy at the ARC-US and you'll see her PowerPoint on the screen. And I'll turn it over to you, Annie. Thank you again for being here. Great, thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to uh, be speaking with you all today. This is my first uh, contact with the Georgia DD Council. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm just gonna talk today uh, briefly about recent federal COVID legislation and how it can affect students with disabilities. Um, I guess, do I need to tell you to move to the next slide? Yes, that would be helpful. Okay, great. So um, on to the next slide. And uh, let's see if I got my copy here as well. Um, so the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, otherwise known as the CARES Act, was enacted on March 27th. That already seems like a really long time ago. Um, and this more than $2 trillion law was mostly intended to keep businesses and individuals economically afloat during the crisis. Um, education programs are a pretty small part of this law, but there are still two uh, basic parts that are most important to the DD community. And this is um, a required report from Education Secretary Betsy DeVos and uh, different funding um, programs that can be used for students with disabilities. So I'll cover those and then of course talk briefly about what we want to see in future COVID legislation. Um, so hopefully you've heard by now, we actually had quite a bit of good news. I know there's not a whole lot of good news these days, so we really need to celebrate it when we have it. Um, about a week or so ago, Secretary DeVos um, issued her report and we were thrilled to see that she did not include recommendations for IDEA waivers, uh, or at least on any core element of the law. And by core element, um, basically mean what we call FAPE, the Free and Appropriate Public Education. Uh, and that, base, that term basically is used to refer to the individualized special education related services that students with disabilities are entitled to um, least restrictive environments, you often hear the acronym LRE. Um, that's the term that we use to essentially uh, describe inclusion, the degree to which students with disabilities 
are educated alongside students uh, who don't have disabilities. And the third one is due process. And that's essentially the ability to challenge decisions that are made by schools and school systems. So those core elements, uh, in fact, the, the Secretary of Education used some very positive language to describe how important these elements are and that there was no need to waive, waive them even during a pandemic. So um, now, despite that really good news, I, I did want to, it's really important to note that Congress still can give the Secretary the authority to um, enact waivers, or Congress can still enact those waivers that allow her to let states waive those provisions. So um, one of the thoughts had been that she uh, was simply allowing Congress to um, take this on if Congress so chooses. So our position in the advocacy community is uh, we're holding firm on no waivers. Um, I, I did want to note there was a, a relatively, you know, small, if you will, waiver that is allowed, which has to do with extending deadlines for um, students or children who are in early intervention on um, delaying some of those uh, evaluations and allowing them to stay in the Part C program before moving on to the uh, Part B. But um, in terms of, you know, what we had feared, it certainly didn't come to pass. But in the meantime, we're, we're maintaining a firm position that we don't want any waivers. Uh, and really trying to beef this argument up by pointing to school districts that are doing a really good job, or at least a, you know, decent job student, serving students with disabilities right now. We just heard, I was um, appreciated Candace's comments about how challenging it was initially in those first few weeks, especially just everybody adjusting to um, this whole new system. And it's, we are hearing more and more that despite some significant bumps initially that things are generally improving. And the, the key to that really seems to be communication. Um, and I know Sheila mentioned that as well. I was sorry to hear that she wasn't having the same degree of success with her school in communicating yet, but the um, communication is the key. And uh, as long as parents can really connect with teachers and school systems and to find out what the student needs, what's working, what isn't, how things should be documented, that is um, just incredibly important. And the other you know, element of all of this, both for teachers and families, is just to document what happens. Um, so I included here on the slide um, a link to a new effort that uh, we're a part of and encourage others to take a look at. It's called Educating All Learners um, and it's an effort to bring together in one place all sorts of different successful materials, tools, resources, guidance, full curricula. The other day I reviewed one from the Arkansas Department of Special Education that I thought was a terrific uh, resource for, particularly designed for students with intellectual disability. It had well over a hundred different resources and broken out by both those that required technology and those that didn't, or at least those that had links to things that could then be printed out um, elsewhere. So I encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, the, um, the funding piece, as I mentioned, it's very flexible pots of money. And obviously flexibility allows for dollars to get out the door really quickly, which is really crucial right now, but it also could pre present some challenges in terms of you know, oversight and where that money goes and what it's used for. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, talk to you all a bit today about engaging, uh, ensuring that your state applies for these funds and uses them effectively and directs as many resources as possible to serving students with disabilities. The uh, first one listed here is the $3 billion Governor's Fund. Um, and this one, interestingly enough, is going to be targeted towards states that have the highest COVID burden. And that's not yet clear. A lot of the uh, guidance for these programs is still being developed. So we don't quite know how many states are going to get these dollars. Um, but were Georgia to be identified as one of the states that's most impacted, we're talking about $105 million for the whole state. So 
it's something it's not as you know as much money obviously as is needed and plus since the dollars can go to both k through 12 and a higher ed that's going to likely mean fewer dollars going to the k through 12 space the the second one the uh, 3.2 billion dollar program um, this is for state departments of education to apply for and they then have to provide at least 90 percent of those funds out to the school districts. Um, and you can see here that both applications were just posted very recently. States are and governors are just starting to apply for these dollars now. I, as of a couple of days ago, I learned that 11 states had applied for one or both programs. The department is not yet maintaining a website listing the state. So I do not know if Georgia uh, has applied yet or where they are in that process. Um, so for that, uh, I wanted to add the, uh, the $13 billion fund, um, Georgia, it's a formula program based on poverty. And so Georgia would be eligible to receive uh, slightly over $450 million. So definitely a bigger, uh, a larger amount of money and targeted towards K through 12. So the good news now is that it's really a great time to start engaging, to start reaching out to your State Department of Education and the districts because they will ultimately be um, getting subgrants for these dollars. And to start really thinking through what are, what are the needs in your community? What are you hearing? What are you experiencing? Uh, is the greatest need, is it devices, you know, computers, laptops, um, servicing, assistive technology, um, mental health supports, uh, more online, you know, face, online face-to-face -face time, that almost sounds like a contradiction, but, um, you know, really start thinking through what gaps you're seeing that you think um, make the strongest case for directing funds that way. So um, I did share, I think it's now on that resource page um, that was just shown a little while ago. I sent a, a template letter for uh, folks to send to their state departments of education and or governors um, requesting meetings or obviously it's a template so you can tailor it to meet your needs, but um, trying to ensure that the subgrants include specific prompts for how districts might spend money on access to technology, on building on what works for students with disabilities, um, on protecting their rights and on utilizing innovative recruitment approaches. Um, oh, thank you. I see you've got that scrolling up on there now. Um, so obviously, you know, letters are always best when you tailor them and tell your story and describe your situation. But uh, I wanted folks to be aware that that resource is there. Another pot of uh, money that is not quite online yet, it was announced, but the application won't be available until May 11th, is um, it's called micro grants. And um, it's a much smaller amount of money across the country. It's $180 million. But um, I have in paren here um, that they're vouchers. And, and they essentially are because this is using public dollars for non-public education, even though the application says that it can be used for public uh, schools, you know, in, in general, the understanding is that this is to provide money for uh, private schools, whether it's online, um, what have you. And um, this, from what we know about this program, it's quite flexible and it would allow for um, you know, these micro grants for families to um, purchase technology and educational services. The states have to make available a list of approved providers and vendors. And this is really gonna be a key part because a lot of it hinges on the quality, on what, what does it take to make it onto that list. We know public schools are, you know, have their share of problems, but there are accountability measures built in and, and advocates need to make sure that any um, provider that makes it onto these state approved lists um, is really uh, credible and able to meet the needs of students with, with disabilities. So um, 
you know, there's, like I said, lots of details um, that, you know, we don't have yet. Um, one of those will be, you know, how many grants for what amount of money. This is really important, particularly for, for vouchers, because we know that one of the problems with voucher programs is they tend not to cover the full cost of educating students with disabilities, particularly those with more significant needs. Um, for example, in Georgia, um, there's two voucher programs and one covers up to $6,800 a year and the other one is, um, has a value of $4,000 a year. And that's pretty, pretty far below what your average per pupil expenditure is in the public education system. So, um, I think that's, um, it's great to find out where, you know, what your state is thinking about this, this particular program right now. But like I said, May 11th is when the full application package is supposed to be posted. So last but not least is money. Um, we, by we, I mean um, a number of advocates, uh, national organizations, and many folks in states have been advocating for uh, additional funding for IDEA. This is quite similar to the amounts that were requested back in 2009 during um, that recession. And so we're seeking uh, 11.3 billion for Part B, so for K through 12 education, also looking for investments in early childhood uh, education and the preschool program. It's worth noting that uh, early intervention in preschool have uh, seen the number of children served increase by approximately 50% and the funding has re remained fairly stagnant. Um, and in addition, the Part D national programs that a lot, may maybe folks on this call aren't as aware of, but they're very important as well. They are, include the, the PTI programs, parent training centers, um, uh, personnel development, and just a lot of the uh, programs that help ensure a, a quality workforce, among other things. Uh, and of course, we want to keep, keep that drumbeat up on the no waivers message. So I don't know if you were, you were going to take questions at the end or, um, but that's pretty much, that's, that's my update. I think I went well over my allotted time. So. Well, thank you, Annie, very much. Um, you, there was a lot of great dialogue in the chat, but I don't think we have any pressing uh, outstanding questions. So we'll, uh, we'll move on to Dr. Smith-Dixon and, uh, and then loop back if time allows. If, are you able to stay with us? Yes, I can, thank you. That'd be wonderful, thank you so much. So we are fortunate to have Dr. Zelphine Smith-Dixon, State Director of Special Education Services and Supports from the Georgia Department of Education with us. And you'll see her PowerPoint here and we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. So good afternoon. And I often like to begin by displaying my picture. And I think that's where many of us are. It's what I used to look like before uh, COVID-19 <laughs> school closures. But eventually we will get back there again. And I am reluctant to call it the new normal. Um, I just say we're dealing with the, the hand that we have been dealt with currently. And so I know that there are a number of um, probably questions, but I did want to share a couple of the slides uh, presented to the state advisory panel on last week, as well as these slides have also been shared with local school systems. And so, um, we in the state of Georgia believe exactly um, a, a lot of the sentiments that I've heard earlier. Um, IDEA is very important um, and it was regulated to ensure rights for students with exceptional needs and their families to make sure that we're addressing and protecting the rights of our students and their families. And we have worked um, even above and beyond the pandemic. We have been very intentional about trying to build that capacity for leaders and teachers to not only implement IDEA, um, I believe across last year, we did perhaps four to five different general supervision kind of back to basic sessions where we started at the very beginning. Um, what does it mean to be identified as a child with a disability? What are our requirements around child find? We discuss evaluation, eligibility, and the list just went on and on. So I think it's 
important as we kind of consider the context we're currently in that we are encouraging every school system. And of course, this afternoon, we've heard uh, great examples and we've heard some that are still works in progress, but we are encouraging every school system to demonstrate what's called good faith efforts to make sure that you're implementing the intent of the law. And so Georgia, not unlike um, others throughout the country, we did not ask for a waiver. But however, we do know, and you can go on to the next slide, we do know that in many instances, there are things that are required through appropriate implementation of IDEA that was not built for a pandemic. And so if you really think about it, when you build rules and regulations and you think about why you are establishing those rules, you don't necessarily have a deep conversation about the what if the whole country gets shut down and you can't implement these pieces in that particular manner. You just don't have those conversations. Because in having those conversations in that particular manner, it begins to chip away and water down the intent of what you're trying to accomplish anyway. And so I think on a, on a federal level, on a national level, at a state level, at a local level, we are encountering something that we have never um, encountered before. And I would not be transparent with you if I didn't tell you there are definite um, challenges with trying to implement um, IDEA as designed. And so what we are saying to um, discussing with our families as well as our school systems, let's make sure that we understand the intent of the law. So that when there are instances where we, for example, have health and safety guidance that will not allow us to interface, what is the intent of the law? And are there ways that we can accomplish um, the spirit of the law, even if we need a assistance based on the criteria of what we've been asked to do. Next slide, please. And so you've heard earlier the one area in which the secretary presented in her report um, as a possible area for a waiver, which is actually um, something that states have to some degree flexibility to do anyway, but it is about the part to see part B transition. And I will tell you, even though these are the babies, this is no uh, small ask, it is very critical. And it is uh, obviously a conversation that we've had in Georgia, even outside of this whole, let's submit to Congress for a waiver. And so in many instances, uh, we know and recognize that the part C, Babies Can't Wait Agency, they provide those early um, intervention services for our young children with disabilities. And there is that handshake that happens so that if um, those students continue to need those services, we uh, have that transition opportunity and those IEPs in place by age three. And so what we know is there have been a number of instances by which this process has become interrupted just based on not being able to complete those evaluations maybe uh, not accomplishing the eligibility meetings, not being able to have the IEP meetings. Again, kind of the North Star in all of this is, tell us about the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law, number one, is always about making sure that we find kids, we locate kids, and we serve those, quick, those children as quickly as possible. And so while there are definite barriers on the Part B side of being able to appropriately transition our young kids to our local school district, it is very beneficial for families of young children with disabilities to know that uh, my kid, my child will still be able to access services until this transition is appropriate. And I do think it is important to note that um, when it comes to evaluations, the guidance that we have given um, as a state, which is aligned with everything else that we've heard out of the Office of Special Education Programs. Um, for example, when it comes to an evaluation, if there are components of that evaluation that cannot be conducted using an alternative mode, those are the instances in which uh, school districts are pausing or looking for um, for other ways to maybe uh, resume on that particular activity when we return to a normal operation. If there are instances in collecting that assessment, that data that can be done with fidelity, because what we don't want to do is we don't want to go through a process of a compliance check to say, I'm doing it and I got it done by a particular date and time. 
However, it may not necessarily reflect the accuracy and the fidelity of the process. And so if districts are able to complete that evaluation to access the information they need, whether it be virtual, um, the advice has been that you should move forward in that particular manner. And it is the same case with IEP meetings. A number of districts have um, demonstrated some, some very innovative practices with abruptly creating opportunities to convene IEP meetings uh, virtually, which is not normally um, a practice for many of our school systems here in Georgia. And so in instances where we could continue the practices and use alternatives in place to accomplish that, that has been the advice or the best practice guidance given. Next slide. And so I think it is important to note that uh, Georgia remains committed to making sure that um, our students access the general curriculum. Um, I think it is critical to note here that access to the general curriculum looks different for everybody right now. And so if we're having a conversation about uh, special education services and what those supplemental services are and how those services relate to the general curriculum, we have to have that conversation in light of how um, all students right now are accessing the curriculum. So in some instances, we know that school systems have been able to move forward with some virtual learning opportunities. In other instances, we know that some school districts have been um, able to move forward uh, without virtual opportunities, but using informational packets, instructional calls, and in some instances, school systems may or may not have been able to move forward with educational services for any student. I'm not talking about specific to special education services for students with disabilities. Next slide, please. And so what we have done within the context of Georgia is to try to create uh, just maybe a quick go-to framework to help local directors really process this work. So for example, if I'm asked to make decisions regarding um, a distance learning plan for a child with a disability, I have the IEP, we're not amending the IEP because I still believe that if we were able to return to that building on next week, this IEP would be the appropriate offering of FAPE. However, uh, the exception is really a COVID-19 exception. And so in light of these circumstances, I need some type of structure um, through the distance learning planning process around what services will be offered to the greatest extent possible. What we ask our directors to do is to consider health and safety guidance, home access and opportunity, the holistic needs of the child, as well as head first success. Next slide, please. And when we're thinking about health and safety guidance, this has felt very awkward because typically when we are sitting in an IEP meeting, um, we make decisions based on the needs of the child, this is the child's present levels, this is what I believe the appropriate services would be, uh, this is how we can help the child to access it. Um, right now, even though those decisions are still appropriate, we have to put them through the health and safety guidelines filter. So for example, three weeks ago, despite the reality that many of our students access face-to-face -face services, those face-to-face -face services weren't appropriate. However, um, and that had to be handled or addressed based on the CDC guidance, based on guidance coming out of the governor's office, maybe based on guidance coming out of the SSEA, as well as lo local board of education guidance. And so you have to ask yourself, yes, I can provide this service, but if I provide this service in this particular manner, is it going to be in the best health and safety interest of the child? Here's the, the sticking point. Just because it's not appropriate for me to provide the services in this way does not necessarily mean that the child should not get the services at all. This is where you can have those critical conversations regarding are there alternative methods that we could use to provide these services for the particular student. Next slide, please. And so a critical piece, which has always been important, but perhaps uh, personified now 
during this global pandemic because instruction is primarily happening um, at home, it's home access and opportunity. Because we can create great opportunities for kids. However, if the students don't have access to those opportunities, then they're going to be irrelevant. So we have to think, and we've had these conversations with local school systems, as you are identifying the services that you're going to provide for kids. Think about how they're going to have access to those services. Think about how they're going to have the same equitable access. And so if I were to decide that everybody in Zelkin School District um, will get virtual learning instruction, do the kids in my school district have access to technology to access that instruction? Do they have access to Wi-Fi in the local homes to access that instruction? Those are a lot of the critical conversations that we have to, to address. Another thing that we have advised our school systems, uh, your distance learning planning in week one or two may look very different than your distance learning planning in week five and week six and week seven. Because what we found is in many instances, we would develop system-wide plans around how we would ensure that kids benefited from services. However, there were individual instances that just didn't work out in that plan. And so during the interim, districts had to make the most appropriate decisions to the greatest extent possible to provide those services. But just because I could not make the services available in this particular manner on week one does not necessarily mean that I cannot make adjustments to make those services available to that child in week two or week three or week four. Next slide. And so here probably, uh, is a critical piece for me. Uh, more importantly than being a state director, um, I am a parent and I'm a parent of three kids. I have a first grader, a fourth grader, and a seventh grader. So when I hear the stories from the parent perspective, um, I totally get it. And as I listened earlier and heard the perspective of just realizing how much uh, less or how demanding this time is for everyone, adults as well as our uh, kids, that becomes a critical part of this puzzle. And so again, just because my child has access to 30 hours of speech instruction during the school year in a face-to-face -face situation, just because the district is willing to offer 30 hours of virtual instruction does not mean that it may be appropriate for my child to access 30 hours of speech instruction in the home setting. And so um, that's an extreme scenario, but it is one in saying we have to be mindful with the, the parent in the particular place of understanding the needs of the child, the needs of the household, how much the child can really handle. And that teacher, um, parent, student communication really become critical. Even as a parent, there are times when I have to say, we can't get this done within this particular uh, time period. I need to make some adjustments. Next slide. So this slide is probably the one we're most familiar. It is. It has that um, traditional feel of we're in that IEP meeting, we're making decisions about student success, we're making decisions about how to make sure that child has the same equitable opportunities as other kids, we're looking at present levels, we're looking at Georgia Standards of Excellence, we're thinking about those IEP goals. And so I'm including this slide last, not because it's less important, I'm including it last because there are other filters that we have to think about when we're making those decisions. So we can't just make instructional decisions right now just based on pretending that all of these other scenarios and dynamics are not happening. We have to consider the holistic needs of the child. We have to consider the home opportunities and access to the instruction that you and the services you're trying to provide. And most importantly, we have to consider that health and safety guidance. Next slide, please. And so this is a, a little different way of thinking, but when we started with the COVID-19 school closures, uh, there we received lots of questions from families as well as from school systems, really trying to process, was this a change of placement? And so just as a reminder from uh, the Office of Special Education Programs, uh, they supported the particular reality that uh, this is not a change of placement. Uh, when you are considering 
an entire school, an entire school district, an entire state having a shelter in place and everyone having to access an alternative mode of instruction uh, that does not represent a change of placement. There are isolated opportunities, for example, if uh, we were in a different place next week and had the opportunity to return to a brick and mortar setting, there might be individual students who it would not be appropriate to return at that particular point. In those instances that would require the IEP team having those conversations and perhaps changing uh, the placement or the environment or the setting for which that child receives services. But based on what we have is we have a change of environment based on COVID-19 exceptions. We're not changing environment because now suddenly 190,000 uh, kids with disabilities in Georgia would learn better from home. Next slide. And so this is uh, guidance that we sent out very early on and made available uh, to school systems. And in a number of instances, uh, school systems were able to uh, pass that guidance along to um, other family members. And if you go to the next slide, it primarily shared uh, just at a very high level, some of the big questions that we uh, received a lot from families and just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. So one of the main questions we kept getting, uh, what happens if uh, all students in the district, the school is closed and no one is getting educational services. So in those isolated instances, the school system would not be responsible for providing special education services during that time. That does not mean that there cannot be a consideration for loss of progress, regression, do, uh, is there something that we need to do um, kind of after we get through this, but the school district would not uh, be on the hook for providing special education services during the time of school closures if they're not providing educational services uh, to all kids uh, during that particular period. And so that was the guidance that came out of the Office of Special Education Programs. Um, the other instance really talking about what will happen to my child services when the school is closed. And this is where we talked about um, how schools had to develop uh, their own plans for moving forward. So in many instances, our schools are implementing distance learning, but distance learning can look very different from one school district to the next. And the third part of the FAQ uh, specifically addresses instances by which for example, if my child is medically fragile and everyone else returns to school next week and my child is unable to return to school, what does that look like for us? What does that process feel like for us? Next slide. And so I think um, kind of in closing around those pieces, we have um, advised our local school systems to really engage with families. Do not um, feel the need to amend an IEP. As I stated earlier, the IEP really is the IEP. I believe that um, when we have the opportunity to go back into that school building, you won't have a need for the distance learning plan. You won't have a need for the interim planning tools. It's like a generator. You would automatically default back to the IEP that was developed to be implemented in that setting. In a number of instances, we received questions about extended school year. Uh, the extended school year services in, in, in IEP are still the extended school year services in that IEP. Um, it is not predicated based on other students in that school system receiving uh, summer learning opportunities. Um, it may be appropriate for the district to consider health and safety guidance. So it is not that I will not provide this, the extended school year services. However, I should consider if we identified face-to-face -face opportunities for extended school year services, and we're still within the scope of time by which we should uh, implement social distancing guidelines, then would it be appropriate to implement the services in this particular manner? We have advised school districts that once we get past this point, um, you should have a process in place to invite and to address each family of all of our students with disabilities 
to do an individual analysis of where that particular student is, um, how that student has maintained and made progress, how that student is performing based on those goals, um, has there been a loss of skills, um, and to address any possible need for compensatory services. And so I think that's kind of the big landscape of the larger conversation that we've been having um, with our school district and um, literally every day speaking with family members as well as representatives from school districts to try to um, make sure that we're providing technical assistance and guidance that uh, would align with the direction that the state is going in. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith-Dixon. We really appreciate this information and your leadership. Sure. And we're gonna move to hearing from Leslie Lipson of Lipson Advocacy about advocacy strategies. And uh, please do keep your questions coming into the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll tackle those in the next segment. Leslie? Yes. Hi, how are y'all? Hi, welcome. Great, so I love going last because then you get to like let other people lay very good foundation, really strong foundation about what's going on. And you get to um, really uh, try to highlight what's going on. And one thing I really want y'all to all take to heart is what we know to be true. What you've known in the past around IEPs and advocacy and kids with disabilities, what you know about a free and appropriate public education, what you know about how you advocate in front for your kids, it's the same, it hasn't changed. Now, the stress we may feel at home, um, the, the fear we may feel about COVID-19 and the pandemic, the way we worry, you know, those things are different. But the law, except in some small ways, has not changed at all. And in the major things that parents, most parents are asking about, it's not different. So that gives us a lot to work from. So I'm just gonna, I supposedly have 10 minutes. I'm gonna try to stick to my 10 minutes. Um, but I wanna talk about how we can use what we've known in the past, and really give you the best information about advocating on behalf of your kids. Um, I'm an attorney and I've been practicing in like 20 years in Georgia. I'm also a parent of two kids who also have disabilities. And so this really is my favorite stuff. So let's do it. First slide. Um, Dr. Smith Dixon covered this beautifully already. The idea being that districts have different ways to go at this. On one hand, you can offer um, education to all the students, that's the second column, it says district, I'm sorry, the first column it says districts open. The district's open, it's providing virtual services, then they gotta, they gotta provide FAPE. The Department of Education really clearly stated um, the districts have to ensure the students with disabilities have um, equal access. It doesn't say uh, good faith equal access, it doesn't say kind of sort of access, it doesn't say determine the access first and then see if people um, then can like access the services, but it's access. And so we really have to look at, try to kind of parse out what is FAPE and non-discrimination in access and what is equity in access. And we're gonna have issues around poverty and people living in, uh, in, in areas where they don't have access to Wi-Fi because there just isn't any Wi-Fi, where um, people haven't ever used a computer to log into Google Docs. And like, these are issues. And these are issues relating to poverty. They're not always related to disability access. But on the other side, we're also gonna have faith issues about what's appropriate for kids. And we're also gonna have a lot of non-discrimination issues about that other kids in the district are being offered um, instruction or work packets or computers or teachers that are, are giving them instruction. But kids with disabilities are being offered not that. And so we really have to keep our eyes out for this. Next slide. And so um, one of the issues is that we have to, part of a 10 minute presentation is that you have to assume that people understand basics. So one of the basics is what is FAPE? Like what's a free and appropriate public education? And FAPE is the substantive standard that has to be provided by schools, not by parents, even still, even though you're, the kids are at home, but FAPE is still an obligation from the school, the district, to the student. So what is that obligation during the times of COVID? And as 
um, and covered beautifully earlier. There was possibilities of waivers, of varying types of waivers, of varying types of places. I'm not gonna spend any time on that because for the average parent who's like at home trying to figure this all out, let me just tell you, there wasn't a waiver. There wasn't a waiver. And so um, the feds came out and did a really nice fact sheet. It's actually pretty okay to read. I don't love reading it, but it's pretty good. Um, but if you really want to understand Andrews well, this understood, easy to read fact sheet with that link, that's by this group called Understood. And it's like an infographic and it really explains FAPE. Um, and I really like that one. I'd look at that one. The next one, the federal government Q&A. If you would like to sleep, you could read that. It's very long. It's like very techy, very like alphabet soupy. But I put it in there in case you really wanted something to like go back to your school and say, this is what the federal government says is the substantive education you're supposed to provide my kid. So I put it in there. Next. So I just really want to clearly lay out for y'all, as clear as I could, that the state of Georgia has not waived the substantive educational standard for students with disabilities and neither has the federal government. Now, we are reasonable in the times of COVID and there's some things that have been waived. So if you have a current ongoing evaluation, 60 days in Georgia, you're not counting the days where the school's closed. You know, we want good quality evaluations, hard to do quality evaluations, not in the same space as a kid. I don't think parents, I think parents are anxious for services, but I don't think anybody's anxious for a substandard evaluation. So we're gonna be waiting for a little bit on, on those types of evaluations. There's some other types of small waivers um, but they're not large waivers. Um, and generally in this kind of short form presentation, I think we should stick to what is still true and correct. Next slide. I love this particular cartoon, people. So documentation, it's so important. This is Jenny. Jenny knows in IEP land, you have it documented, it didn't happen. So Jenny documents and everything. Be like Jenny, get documentation. So let me tell you, we are all stressed. So stressed. Teachers are stressed. Administrators are stressed. Parents are stressed. The kids are stressed. And we really aren't going to remember well what happened during this time. I can barely remember what happened two or three weeks ago during this like roller coaster of emotion. And I hate to put this on a parent's backs to say you're in charge of logging and keeping track. But I want to tell you, you're in charge of logging and keeping track. When we go back to sit at these IEP tables, either virtually or in person. Both could happen in the fall. We just don't know what happens in August. Normally, schools tell families where their kids are. They say, this is your kid's present level. Your kid's reading this. Your kid likes this. Your kid behaves like this. Who's going to be the holder of all that information come fall? Parents. Parents. Teachers will know a lot if they're interacting with students. But for some kids and some parents and some, a lot of people I've talked to, parents are gonna be the primary holder of a lot of that information. Um, I think it's actually kind of a gift. You asked me you know, to be like all like kind of, isn't this the greatest time? And I really love Pinterest and I'm just having the best time with my family and kids. It's not totally true, it's a hard time. But if I was doing all of that, I would tell you the best part of this is that people are really spending a lot of time with their kids and learning a lot about how their kids learn, what their kids know, and what's next. So you cannot count on the school to say, we offered this amount of instruction, we offered these worksheets, we offered this computer, we helped you troubleshoot the technology, we had the Parapro sign in and help prompt this behavior on this assignment. You can't count on that, you gotta log it. So next slide. So I found some logs and I just, you know, shorten them up for y'all to take a look at, say kind of, what kind of style you are. If you're somebody, um, this week, first one is a weekly fillable log. Um, it's kind of intense, but like if you're one of these people that likes logging everything, then you might enjoy it, but you can fill it in online if you're an online person. Um, this service fillable log for teachers, I thought was really helpful. I'm betting there are teachers on this who are interested in this idea. and. It's also fillable and it wasn't quite as extensive, but it let teachers pull it out. The simple log for families would probably be the one I personally would use in my house. Like I could imagine actually having the wherewithal to fill it out and people can print that out. Um, I also like the one from the Florida PTI. Um, it's also pretty simple and really good to fill out. So these are just some options for y'all to be keeping logs. Um, when we meet, 
again, to look at present Lowe's performance, this information is going to be super helpful. And if you don't want to log the amount of services and you are unsure of where your kid is and how they're learning, go back to all the things you already know. We can use videos from our iPhone of a kid reading a certain book or doing a certain type of worksheet or navigating a certain thing at one period of time and again at another period of time. You can use work samples, either things you've pulled off the internet or things that you know from books or work, work books or things the school's provided in work packets or you can take a video of the kid doing a module on a computer. You obviously can't you know, violate other people's privacy rights, but there are ways around that, especially with um, technology, because you can pretty easily edit anybody out. I can edit myself out of this and look like I'm not here. So you can use this. There are really creative ways. You can use this good faith effort, good faith. How are schools gonna prove that they did good faith? Well, they're gonna show we try to contact parents. So you need to be going back to the schools and saying, I got the email, my kid signed on to Zoom to meet with their teacher and the teacher wasn't there. You need to be documenting the good faith effort or what's not a good faith effort. Um, I got the worksheets of the same worksheets you sent home the past three weeks and my kid's super bored with them. You need to be telling schools what's going on. Obviously, if things are good, you should also be saying that. People don't call me when they're happy, so I'm not used to documenting the things that are good, but you should document the things that are good. So I'm more likely to hear from people when they're unhappy. Um, when you're thinking about how you're gonna measure progress, the IEP is still the controlling document. People talk about these distance learning plans and like individualized learning plans and individualized virtual learning plans and all these other kind of like jargony things. If that helps people, fine. The legal document that's required exists and is there and is still there and will be there when we go back, if we're gonna go back one day, is the IEP. That is what you should be focusing on. So if you're looking at how do you evaluate progress and monitoring and regression for your kid, look back at the IEP. If what's written in there you don't understand, email the school and say, I don't understand what that is. I don't understand how to measure that. Do you understand how to measure that? Can you measure that? Could you get on the phone or the computer and measure that with my kid? How do you do that? Ask all the questions. Be the curious person you are. Okay, next slide. Okay, as much as I like to sound really sure that I know what I'm doing, and you're really not used to hearing lawyers say this, we don't know all the answers. We are in an unprecedented time where we, we don't know all the answers. But I do know that you will not be sorry come fall or come next IEP meeting that you have good rec records and good documentation of what's been going on with your kid. I'll promise you that. I also don't think you'll be sad, and I don't think I'll be sad, that we took as much time as we could take with our kids to work on some of the things we might not have had time to work on during the year. And I just say that to you as another mother. That's not your obligation, your legal obligation, um, according to um, our federal civil rights laws, but it is just kind of, I think, a truth for many families during this time because we're kind of all stuck together. Next slide. And this is the other idea. And I use this slide in my presentations all the time, teaching people about how to advocate for their kid. Same stuff all the time. So you don't, don't ask, can my child participate in distance learning? It's not the question. The question is what supports make it my child's participation possible. And let's be clear, this whole COVID pandemic thing, it is unprecedented. Teletherapy, tele-OT, tele-physical therapy, um, classes online, these things are actually not so new. They're not brand new. They've been done for quite some time. There are whole schools that are online. And we actually have a lot of research and information about providing special education services online. Um, and teachers and administration and other people are going to have to really put some investment and help people get up to speed. But this is the obligation of FAPE. To just say, we don't know how to do it, good faith effort, let's see if we can just kind of, you know, skate till we get there. I'm not gonna do it. I think the other possibility is we're gonna end up back here again. You know, as much as I don't, I don't know anything that you don't know. But I think there's a very good chance that we might go back into virtual education times at different periods going forward, which is one reason you probably wanna get your advocacy mojo on during this time period because you'll be able to use it again in the future. 
Okay, the next slide is, I have not been looking at the chat as we're going, but I'm sure there are a lot of questions. And so I was thinking, or I'm going to next um, Tuesday at 10 a.m. do a Facebook Live and try to run through more specific questions people have and other types of advocacy ideas. I didn't talk about assessments. I didn't talk about social. I didn't talk about promotion for next year. I didn't talk about grades. I didn't talk about transition services. I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, the opportunities are enormous and endless. Um, but I just wanna reassure you that everything that you've known in the past about educational advocacy is still true. All of the rights that your child had before COVID, they still have. Um, and all the rights that parents have around advocacy and being involved parents and getting information and communicating with schools are all still as important. Okay, thank y'all. Wow, thank you, Leslie. And you stay, kept us just about back on schedule. There are about four questions in the chat that I think um, we're gonna try to tackle quickly and then see if anybody on the phone needs to unmute and ask a question. And, um, and then we'll move to announcements. So Mark, did you have questions from the chat box or Dana that you wanted to read for the group? Yeah, I pulled a couple of questions as we were going through. So some things that tackled some of the ones that on the, the first time. Dana, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Right. Yes. Uh, the person said they kicked off the evaluation IEP process for their six year olds in late February, but then COVID. Are there any protections against my child being placed in a classroom without support come fall? if the IEP isn't in place by then? It's a great question. So I, I didn't hear the last bit, the last like 10 words. Are there any protections against my child being placed in a classroom without support come fall if the IEP isn't in place by then? You losing me? I can hear you. Yeah, I can repeat that. Did you catch it, Leslie? I kind of caught it. I think the idea generally was a kid had an evaluation. The evaluation has not either totally happened or been conclusion or they haven't met and had an eligibility meeting. The parents worried about fall placement. The kid goes to school in the fall, is not eligible and has no protections. Was that? Yeah, that's scenario? it. Right. Um, well, number one, I think the parent should clearly state that's where they are. If that is where they are, I don't see what else the school you know can do but if the school's open for in-person stuff before school actually starts they may be able to work on that evaluation before school actually starts but um, I think that's really a communication issue and and you know there are protections for kids not yet identified that's what I would google if I was that parent google the terms not yet identified that's the whole like pre-child find thing and is Dr. Dr. Smith Dixon on? She would have a lot to say. Let's see. I have to search. Um, and I put the question in the chat box too. Like the, I went and found it. Thank you. Um, so any others, Dana or Mark, that you wanted to read off? And then I think we'll move to. You. I was gonna, does anybody else from the Department of Ed have a answer to that question? I know there's a couple people on. Okay. Is Elsa is not on the call? I didn't see her. Well, I mean, it's it's a dilemma, just like Zell talked about a little bit earlier. That um, you know, you you need to have good communication. Leslie also said that with the parent and wherever they are in the evaluation process with this child. If it was just that the permission was signed, or if they were in the middle of it and they'd already completed most of the um, evaluation process. Of course, an evaluation is not just about the testing with the student, but it's also the collection of information through the referral, the observations, work samples, things of that nature too. And there may be a way to accomplish some of that virtually. Uh, he's a young child based on what I see from the question. 
and it may be very inappropriate to try to do something virtually, especially if uh, for the suspected disability area. And it may be that it has to be deferred until there can be in-person uh, contact with the school psychologist or diagnostician. But that needs to all be come together in an agreement um, on when they will complete it. So there's not an easy answer there, but certainly it shouldn't be ignored. There should be some means of communication and some uh, determination going. Um, Leslie's already said there are some protections um, with children that have not yet been identified. And certainly there's the multi-tiered system of support process, which should provide supports for students that weren't necessarily identified with special education, but to accommodate and provide the necessary structure and supports at any tier of instruction for the uh, child to have effective um, supports and benefits until uh, it can be determined if he's eligible or not. So, you know, SST, student support team, is a part of MTSS, but um, that's, those are all things that talking with the child's principal or if the child is in evaluation, talking with the child special ed director at the county or city uh, system level or charter school would be the thing to do to understand where are we, what's the plan about moving forward. Kate, I have the questions that Dana pulled. That's great. All right, the next one's a follow-up question to evaluation. Will we pick up on the time required for evaluation or will the evaluation clock start over upon ability to return to face-to-face -face meetings? I think you pick it up, but you just have to be careful. The same kid that went out on March 13th might not be the same kid, you know, the, all the same, um, you know, specifics that come back, God willing, August. I, I just think we have to be really careful about, about, um, what the law says and, and you know, what, what we really want for students. All right, um, what if your kid's district is not offering any services during the pandemic? What data should we take? He won't complete any optional learning activities. He knows they are optional. Cause that's a smart kid. I have a kid like that. I know that deal. Yeah, I think that's, I think that, you know, I think that's, all these parents across the nation asking that question, parents because the disabilities went out. So you're right. So the question really becomes, how do you document present levels of performance so you can get a good IEP next year based upon there not being educational um, um, data March 13th or 14th on? Um, and I, you know, this is a place I really be looking to teachers and educators about this. Um, and I think that there'll have to be conversation about what are those present levels for, you know, teachers are experts at meeting kids come August that came from out of state, or came somewhere else, another count, you know, and, and assessing where kids are. Um, and I think for that kind of stuff, I think the pressure on parents to have all the data is a lot less than the idea that you may be looking for compensatory services because there isn't, that's a different story that they're just not offering any services to anybody. If I was a parent, I'd be looking for these little bitty cracks of interest of like what we could be doing that might move a kid on, but that's a different thing. What do you yeah. think, Ms. Lai? Winna, <laughs> any thoughts? Well, um, you know, yes, I think that they'll have to assess where the child is and then make, again, um, multi-tiered system of support is, you know, where that, that includes all of our uh, systems, but there are um, pre-planned interventions, there are, um, you know, individualized interventions, or specially designed instruction, and just like Leslie said, we are used to picking up kids with where they are and, and moving forward from there. I Thank definitely you. would engage a child in what they're interested in. You know, you, it's, uh, it's kind of like economics. You find what the need is and you meet that market need. And the same thing with children, you find out what they want to do and you take them to where they want to go with it. It may be unorthodox, but keep them engaged and active and interested so that you'll be happy and they'll be happy too. Uh -huh. Such a pragmatic answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think we have time for maybe. I have one, one. more. Yeah, one last question, and then I want to be sure we can cover some key announcements. 
And if you have more questions, please put them in here and we will get answers from those um, who can provide the answers. So go on and type them in or send them in the email address and somebody will put that in the chat box. The last question is advice for parents working full time that have a child that requires hand over hand for everything. I can't and I don't dedicate six hours a day to my son. Tough one. I mean, that is super tough. I mean, I think I would have to call, call, go back to the IEP team. I would call for a meeting. I'd ask them what they've seen in the past. I think the idea that every single thing is hand over hand sounds to me to be something to, to maybe re-examine. Um, I never really met anybody that is 100% every single thing hand over hand. So I, I think I'd be looking for, for what are the areas of, of interest um, and what are the other possibilities of technology. I don't think it's a parent's obligation to, to be providing FAPE six, six hours a day, but I think parents need to really clearly, I'm putting my finger in the, in the camera so you know what I'm saying. You have to clearly say that you can't do that. You don't want schools to come back in the fall saying we offered these things, but the parent wouldn't, you know, do these things to make it happen. You know, judges have never been super favorable, nor are decision makers around parents who don't, um, who don't partner with the school. So I do think you want to be really clear about that. But I do think that's a particularly hard situation. And I think when Zell said, um, you know, this isn't what IDA imagined. I think you know those, those are the situations I think where we struggle. All right, guys, it is 431. Thank you for hanging in with us. Uh, we're gonna, we were going to review the wonderfully organized uh, frequently asked questions document that the team uh, with Hillary Hibbins technical assistance has created. And we're gonna bump that to next week. And I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa and Charlie for a few closing announcements. Thank you so much, Kate. Y'all, we are so happy to have all these participants be on. And we're so happy to have all these great folks able to come and speak with our community. It shows our community is really listening to each other. So a few quick announcements. Uh, next meeting will be Tuesday. May 12th, so mark your calendars from 3 p.m. to 4.30. Uh, and then also uh, within the state news, state session is tentatively to reopen June 11th with uh, committee meetings starting uh, 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 this week for appropriations. So we're gonna be gearing back up for some advocacy. And then also, uh, please register for, uh, uh, for all, all of our events. Uh, and that email is gaddcovid19 uh, at gmail.com. And, and then also, please, please complete our survey that we will be sending out. We want to make sure that we capture everyone on the call. Guys, thank you again for being on the call and we look forward to advocating with y'all. So guys, let's get after it. Thank you. Thanks y'all.